Okay, we're live. Hello, all. Um, I am sorry that I'm late. I was uh, trying to talk to my mechanic in Spanish and I don't speak Spanish. Oh, I hear myself. I hear an echo. Let me close all my windows here. Okay, there we go. I don't need to hear my voice after I already say, after I already hear it. Mm. <laughs> um, okay, we're here. This is our, our now weekly. I'm very excited that this is weekly and, and regular because I'm really enjoying it. And I hope that you all are enjoying it. And I hope that you, Mary Lou, are also enjoying it. I'm loving it. I'm so glad we're doing this. Oh, okay, good. Okay. Yeah, so we're here now every Wednesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern time, which is 5 p.m. Pacific time. Um, I'm Megan Murphy, of course, and I am, as I like to remind everyone, very, very, very much shadow banned on this platform, YouTube, and so it's helpful both to me and to you to subscribe to the channel so that you get notifications uh, when we start these lives um, and when I post new stuff. I did, somebody told me recently that they were subscribed to my channel and yet they couldn't find my channel even by searching my name on YouTube. So that's cool. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I'm, I'm glad that some of you are obviously finding us and, and hopefully now that we're here every single Wednesday. Yes, Megan. Hi, Megan. We're here. There's another Megan in the live chat. Non-H Megan. Um, uh, we're here every every Wednesday night. So you guys can just remember that even if YouTube refuses to remind you, perhaps. Um, we're also live on Twitter. So hello also to the people watching on Twitter where I don't believe that I'm shadow banned as of yet. I think that's the only platform that I'm not shadow banned on, actually. I don't have, like Facebook, I'm completely erased. Nobody, mm -hmm. nobody, like, and I'm not just saying nobody, like, I think I, I've had 10,000 followers for like two or three years now on Facebook and about three people see the things that I post <laughs> every time. <laughs> I'm laughing, but it actually drives me insane. It makes me feel angry and crazy. Um, then I guess that's a good reason to try to not be dependent on social media. Um, so this is Mary Lou Singleton. If any of you are new here, Mary Lou is a herbalist and a nurse practitioner and a midwife and a wise witch. <laughs> um, <laughs> and... Uh, she has a really great substack, and we're actually going to talk about one of her, her posts this evening. But her substack is at Enchanted Family Medicine um, at Substack. And I think you're, st you're still doing the other podcast, correct? I am. We just um, we slowed down a little bit. But Jocelyn and I are still doing a podcast, How I Healed, which you can find us at um, How I Healed on Substack. Awesome. And wherever you um, get your podcasts. Cool. Thank you everyone for tuning in. Um, I, I hope that people in the live chat will comment and ask questions. As I like to remind people, I can't keep a super, super close eye on it because it distracts me from the conversation at hand, but I do try to keep an eye on it. And if you have something really, really, really important that you definitely want me to see, or ask or take note of, you can use the super chat. Um, and if you're on Twitter, then I'm afraid I'm not paying attention to the mentions. So I've forgotten about all of you already. Um, I think like one of, yeah, so so one of the posts that I, I wanted to talk about today with Mary Lou, of course, because Mary Lou wrote the post is, is about building community and friendship. Um, but I did want to just quickly complain about Matt Walsh before we got into that <laughs> while I have the opportunity. <laughs> and and seeing as this stream is sort of named after him, after all. <laughs> like I don't think I don't think where all the women is actually Matt Walsh Matt Walsh's quote, but I feel like it's its implication is a criticism of Matt Walsh and the Matt Walsh's of the world. 
um, who, you know, claim to be leaders of the the fight for reality and and women as adult human females, but refuses to acknowledge that women have been fighting this fight for, for many, many years and insists that all we've been doing is sitting on the sidelines and whining. Um, so here we are. We're not going to be erased. I mean, we are we are being erased by YouTube, of course, but we're <laughs> <laughs> we're not going to stop talking just because they want us to. Um, so I think it was this. I this I actually found hilarious. Usually, Matt Walsh just makes me like really, really irate, but this tweet I actually thought was quite funny because I think it revealed how unthinking, that's a polite way of describing him, how unthinking he really is. So I think, I mean, the big, the big news story this week or the big thing that everyone's talking about on Twitter and, you know, and SNL, of course, is these MIT and Penn and Harvard um, presidents and whatnot who refuse to condemn calls to genocide Jews um, which is like, like I'm, did you follow the story, Mary Lou? It was crazy. Yeah. That, um, calling for the genocide of Jews. Um, what did they say? It's, it does. The question was, does it violate the code of conduct at these schools? And all three presidents of these, these prestigious schools said it depends on the context, like in which yeah. you are calling for the genocide of Jews. And these are all institutions that have um, fired women for speaking out against gender ideology, have censured students for, for using, you know, for refusing to use wrong sex pronouns. There are places that have uh, overtly, repeatedly violated the free speech rights of their students and their faculty, but suddenly they're saying calling for the genocide of Jews is protected speech under their free speech codes. Right. I mean, it's hilarious because it's like that's the, actually the only thing that's not protected under any free speech code <laughs> is calling for genocide. Right. Um, right. Or, yeah, like directly um, calling on people to murder other people. Um, and I mean, the the most insulting thing about these women's refusal to condemn calls for genocide which should be like a pretty easy thing to do. I understand that the debate is very complicated and what's mm -hmm. going on over there is complicated and I don't want to oversimplify that, but they were asked a very direct question, which again was, does calling for the genocide of Jews violate, this is, you know, they, they one of the mm -hmm. main people that has been criticized and now fired was Liz McGill, who was president of Penn. Mm -hmm. um, so they, so she was asked as calling for the genocide of Jews violate Penn's rules or code of conduct, yes or no. And she kept replying over and over again, something along the lines of if the speech turns into contact, it could be harassment, which is a bit confusing because I feel like if the speech turned into conduct, the conduct would be genocide. <laughs> right. It was a little like a step up from harassment. <laughs> it's but I mean, yeah, like, but of course, like none of these people would would hesitate to say, yes, it does violate the code of conduct if it was any other identity group, like if it was trans, if it was black people, okay. if it was Muslims, like it wouldn't be a, it wouldn't be a difficult question for them to ask. And of course it would go much farther than that because these are all the types who would consider calling a trans woman a man or he to be to be hate speech so mm -hmm. it's maddening on that part but I, because all that happened i guess finally the libs as it were started <laughs> to speak out about what's going on in universities um and i guess started to realize that there was a problem with universities pushing political agendas instead of sticking to being educational institutions, um, which made Matt Walsh angry. <laughs> <laughs> right. I feel like men are so, I, should, I, I shouldn't say men because it's totally stereotyping, but it's just like, I mean, essentially what Matt Walsh complained about and what I saw some other people complaining about too, some well, uh, other men complaining about too, is that 
these people were latecomers. Um, mm-hmm. So Matt Walsh, like to the to the to the debate. So Matt Walsh says, many on the right are giving this guy credit. He's talking about a monologue for on CNN from Fareed Zak. Karia. Um, mm-hmm. Many on the right are giving this guy credit for this monologue. He's saying what conservatives have been shouting from the rooftops for decades, yet he never acknowledges the fact or apologizes for ignoring us. <laughs> like, I cannot believe that these words are coming out of his mouth. Right. The lack of self awareness was, I-, I don't know why I'm shocked because it is Matt Walsh and he's not known as especially self-aware guy, but is literally um, behaving in the way that that he, you know, when women say exactly what he's been saying, he he has had nothing but disdain for them, right? For the exact like we've been saying, why is everyone giving Matt Walsh credit for what we've been shouting from the rooftops for years? Why doesn't he at least acknowledge us for for what we the groundwork we have done? He's saying. Um, that same critique of it without any self-awareness of, of all the, the times he's gotten angry at women for pointing this out to him about his work. Yeah, it's amazing because he uses the exact same word, just words essentially yeah. that so many women have said to him over and over and over. Like, why are you guys giving, why are you guys giving him credit for this monologue? He's just saying what we've been shouting from the rooftops for decades. Mm -hmm. Why won't he even acknowledge us? He won't even acknowledge that we said it first. He never apologized for ignoring us, which is literally, you know, exactly what he's done and exactly what he's been criticized for. And I just can't believe, I mean, yeah, like you, I guess I can believe because I think he's obtuse and like a total, narcissist so why Mm -hmm. would he have any self-awareness but it is it's really crazy that he wouldn't think oh gosh i shouldn't say this because this is going to make me look like a massive hypocrite exactly and i you know if i had more tolerance for going back through matt walsh's twitter feed which i often find just enraging um I, I wanted to go back and find his exact uh, hateful and mean comments that he's made to women. You know, the word hateful is overused, but he he really has been um, just disdainful to, to women who've said this exact feedback to him of like, oh, well, if you'd done a better job, people would have heard what you were saying. And obviously you weren't very effective at it. And, you know, um, if you if you actually were smart, people would have listened to you. <laughs> he's uh Well, yeah. And like, why are you complaining? Like, you should be glad that people are getting on board and who cares who it is or when they join, you should just be grateful that now Mm. it's catching on. Right. Right. Which I mean, I, I do understand that argument. And I, but I just, I mean, my, I think my main anger around the men who either have failed to acknowledge that women have been shouting from the rooftops about this for years and were ignored or erased. Um, And now finally people are speaking out, but of course in many ways it's too late. We're working backwards Mm -hmm. and we're working backwards against something that's been institutionalized across the West um, and written into law. Um, But you know, like all of these right wing people who aren't just men. I've seen women say this too, but it's most often Mm -hmm. men, which is where all the women, where are the feminists? Why is nobody speaking about this? And it's enraging because we just tried so hard and we had no, and the reason that we weren't heard, you know, there, I think there are strategic criticisms that can be made for sure of the radical feminists who were trying to make noise about this years and decades ago. But I think the main reason that we weren't heard was because we didn't have the resources or the funding to hold the events that we wanted to because we would either get canceled or we just didn't have the security needed to to protect us, but also because the people in power with the platforms wouldn't platform us. So there's only so far that you can get with a feminist blog. Right. And, you know, I do want to point out it wasn't just feminist women being silenced on this. Um, as a right. uh, founding member of Hands Across the Aisle, like that, that was a, a group of us coming mm. from both the right and the left, and that we were also ignored. And the, the conservative women who were speaking out, like um, Kaylee Harms and um, Emily Zinos, really brilliant, articulate women, were also being ignored by, by men like Matt Walsh. 
I um I do want to give some credit to the the Heritage Foundation of being an example of an institution on the right who was paying it that was paying attention to this. Um, Ryan Anderson does credit credit the work of women in his book um, When Harry Became Sally, which is a clever title. You know, but he <laughs> does quote. Um, you know, he he quotes the women that he's talked to. He recognizes the the analysis that the the women who've been speaking out of this had presented to him. He was an example of a guy on the right who who did it correctly, right? Who actually mm -hmm. gave some credit to women. And I know for a fact that those of us in Hands Across the Aisle wrote, reached out to the Daily Wire repeatedly asking Matt Walsh and Ben mm -hmm. Shapiro to give us some airtime and to cover this issue. And they ignored it at the time. And that was, was that like 20, 2016 that we met at the Heritage Foundation, 2017, another group of, of feminists and conservative women met at the Heritage Foundation. Matt Walsh knew about the women, or at least we had reached out to his organization and he chose not to act on it then. He waited until it was safer to talk about this issue. And I think, I suspect that he probably wanted to position himself because he has positioned himself now as the sole person who has been challenging this, who is challenging this, who mm. is speaking out and nobody else was doing anything. And he's the one brave truth teller who had the guts to say that women are adult human females. You know, they had the gall <laughs> to, I know that, you know, it's not posy. Cozy Parker can't, Kelly J. Keene can't copyright that. It's a dictionary definition, but mm -hmm. it is the main, it, it's the thing that made her famous because she put it on right. a billboard that got canceled. And, and I doubt, I doubt very much that Matt Walsh wasn't aware of her work. And um, <laughs> if he wasn't aware of his, of her work, he, is not doing any research on this issue at all, right? Like it, either way, it indicts him. <laughs> like he either stole it from her work and didn't give her credit, or if he wasn't aware of what Posey was doing, he didn't delve really deeply into this issue. No, I mean, I'm sure that he knew who she was. I think yeah. that would be pretty crazy to not have noticed her. Um, but I mean, yeah, and I think... If, you know, and Matt Walsh has been talking about this for a long time, not as long as, you know, these radical feminists who were talking about it back at in the Mishfest days mm -hmm. um, or as long as, you know, Jermaine Greer or Sheila Jeffries. I mean, he wasn't born back when Jermaine Greer was talking about it, but um, mm -hmm. in the set, the first time, I mean. <laughs> um, but, you know, all of these all of the right wingers who, and I, sorry, I don't, I hate to do this categorization. So I like, I know that it's lazy and it's not fully accurate. So I need to try harder to stop doing that. Cause you're right. It wasn't just feminists speaking out and it wasn't even just women speaking out. It was mostly mm -hmm. women, but we had a lot of men who were supporting us like Brandon Schulwalter and mm -hmm. um, uh, Brendan O'Neill and um, Graham Linehan right. and Derek Jensen. Um, mm -hmm. and, and the men of the Heritage Foundation. And the men of the Heritage Foundation. I mean, Brennan Showalter, I hope I'm saying his right name properly. Mm -hmm. He works for a Christian newspaper. Like he's right, technically right. on the Christian right. Um, mm -hmm. So. And I don't know if I would say Ben Shapiro has worked with women on this issue, but Ben Shapiro was one of the um, first voices speaking out in any like, mainstream outlets on yeah. this back in like 2013, 2014. Zoe Turr, a uh, huge man, I think he's like well over six foot five, who was special forces in the military, who now says he's a woman, threatened to to severely harm Ben Shapiro. Remember when right. Ben Shapiro was... <laughs> Yeah, ben, right. ben Shapiro is a really little guy. He's not a huge guy. And Zoe Tur is enormous and told said that if Ben Shapiro didn't didn't stop um, saying Zoe Tur is a man, he was going to send him home in an ambulance. Yeah. Yeah. I remember <laughs> that. Yeah. He has yeah. he has been speaking out about this in a pretty intelligent way, I think, for a long mm -hmm. time. Right. And, you know, and he supported me when I was kicked off of Twitter 
and, you know, tried to help me out as best he could in that regard. And so, you know, he reached, he did reach out to me. Mm-hmm. And of course, Matt Walsh has never reached out to any woman to support her. And he certainly could have, because he, he did know that this was going on, you mm-hmm. know, at a point, I think, when it could have been stopped. I mean, I, the right. thing I think that makes me the most mad, or at least that sounds like a rational and non-petty reason to be angry, is that, <laughs> like, if people had listened to women, that I we could have stopped it from happening in the first place. Mm-hmm. And now right. it's, yeah, now, as I said before, it's almost, it feels too late and we're at least working backwards and we're working with the, in these like limitations of, we, well, we're just talking about children and what's safe and best for children. And, you know, like, sure, maybe, maybe it's good for some kids to trans, but, you know, we need to be more cautious, like this kind of thing, which is like, yes, of course we have to protect the, ch- the children. It's disgusting what's happening to children. Mm-hmm on account of this trans ideology that's filtered down from autogonophiles. But, you know, the the woman factor is forgotten mm-hmm. in all of that. Right, right. Just how profoundly insulting it is to women to begin with and and how harmful on so many levels. And then we're also, like I said, we're working in these parameters. There's still far too many people who seem to believe this true trans narrative that a small population, uh, you know, a small percentage of the population really are trapped in the wrong body, <laughs> that they, yeah. they actually are a woman stuck in a man's body, and which makes no sense, is completely unscientific, is, again, profoundly insulting to women, um, is sexist to the core, but we're dealing with that level of the apologists. And you can't undo what's been done legislatively if you believe that that there is such a thing as being born in the wrong body, right? Like it's-, it's No, I think it's so crazy that you could mm-hmm. legitimize the concept of transgenderism itself and say, oh, well, you know, this is what a lot of these people who I think are new to this issue will say, which is that these men in change rooms, you know, he's not even really trans. He's not right. a real trans. He's just faking it. And it's like, wait, so what is a real trans? How do we know? Which, mm-hmm. which men are allowed into change rooms? I guess like Blair White type men, men who've right. gotten enough cosmetic surgery to look like some version of a porn star are allowed into the women's change room, but not the other guys. Are they allowed into the jails too? Like, Right. And, and it's, it's so upsetting, this idea, well, oh, if they've had enough surgery, and again, it comes down to you're basically saying women are just castrated men. That we, like, we're back to that medieval idea of what a woman is, right? <laughs> we're just um, you know, inadequate human beings who aren't complete because we don't have a penis. So if a man cuts his penis off, he joins our ranks. Right. And yeah, and again, it's just, it, it legitimizes the concept, which is nonsensical in itself, that you can be born in the wrong body and that if you, you know, there can be such a strong feeling inside you that, that you're the opposite sex, that you should be treated legally as mm-hmm. the opposite sex, which I think right. is crazy and obviously dangerous, or I, th- I you'd think it would be obvious. But I think, I mean, I... I was I did a free speech event in Toronto recently and at the Q&A this blonde woman came up to me like or sorry just before the Q&A in the intermission and um I had been trying really hard to take a pee break but there was people there that wanted to say hi so I was just saying hi to people and having nice chit chat and this chit chat and this woman came up to me and she was like totally enraged um, because I was mean to this man that we talked about a while back named Julia Malott on Twitter, I guess. That was all I could see. I was like, what is it that you're angry about? Well, you were just, you were so rude and insulting and mean. And I was like, okay, I don't think I actually was that insulting to him, but there's lots of people that I mean to on Twitter. So give me a break. And then she sort of got to the point. She was just she was flabbergasted at why I kept calling him he. So I think like maybe that was the main thing that I insisted on calling him a man and calling him he. And she's at this, this free speech event for, you know, it was mostly like 
I mean, anybody should be able to come to these things, of course. But I think at this particular event, it was mostly kind of the heterodox people. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of those people, unfortunately, not necessarily the people in the audience, but I mean, in general, the people who are sort of the on the the anti-woke. Um, oh, no, we have to start challenging Soji in schools and challenging gender identity have gotten involved because of the kid issue, because of what they're teaching in schools, because they they see it as sort of, and fair enough, you know, like sexualizing kids mm -hmm. too early and teaching them about sexual things that they shouldn't be learning about, but also teaching them about things like gender identity. But they still want to be polite and they still mm -hmm. buy into this, this true trans Thing, where right. some some people are actually trans and that's mm -hmm. fine and we should respect them and be nice to them and accept their pronouns whatever they say um and everything else like i guess i don't know what the test would be to determine who's a real trans and who's not and who should right. be referred to as she when they're a male and who should not and and then like who should be allowed in women's prisons who should be allowed on our sports teams who should be um you know, who should be providing our intimate care if we show up and need a rape exam, who who's doing our mm. pat downs, like it if that's the piece they never follow it through to like these are men, regardless of how distressed they are about being men, regardless of how great the links that they've gone through to um, to change their genitalia surgically or to take hormones they are never actually women and they don't follow it through of like, if you acknowledge that some men are actually women, that hurts women. Well, and, and it actually hurts kids because the, yes. the argument ends up being that then some kids are actually trans and right. then maybe right. some kids do need puberty blockers and hormones so that they can properly trans when mm -hmm. they're adults, right? So they don't go through puberty so that they can right. look effeminate. So it can pass yeah. even though they have no sexual function. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Yeah, exactly. Which I don't <laughs> think should happen to any kid. I don't really care mm -hmm. how much so-called gender dysphoria they have. Mm -hmm. um, but I can't remember why I started talking about this. <laughs> well, I was going to ask, did you... Did you engage Matt Walsh on Twitter? Did you, did you attempt? Oh, I know. I just, I, I quote tweeted him and I said, mm -hmm. I simply cannot because I just... I mean, what I get, you can't explain anything to him. Like I, I do yeah. literally, I love diagnosing people with psychological disorders, <laughs> but I, I do, I think he must be a narcissist because what, I mean, what kind of person is so lacking in humility and self-awareness? Yeah. Like, well, I don't I, think he'd get it if you said that to him. He hasn't gotten anything that anybody yeah. said to him that's critical. I mean, he doesn't seem like a very smart or a very nice person. And as much as my you know, my Venn diagram doesn't overlap a lot with Ben Shapiro. I, I respect his intellect. And I think that he speaks very respectfully about his wife and about, I've, I have not heard him say um, overtly woman hating sexist things where Matt Walsh, that's his whole like cachet, right? He's, mm -hmm. he's selling sexism. He's selling being a, a jerk, you know? <laughs> so no, you don't oh, yeah. really I him. really like Ben Shapiro. I think he's mm -hmm. really super smart and I think yeah. he is really respectful. And of course I don't agree with him on everything, but of course I don't agree with anybody on everything. Right. I mean, right. but yeah, like I think Matt Walsh is actively advocating that we regress back to, I don't even know what time you would want to go back to. Right. Um, but certainly a time when women didn't have rights like right. actually, like, I don't think that's an, I'm not just saying that glibly. Um, I think that's what he wants. I think that he thinks that women should be mothers and wives and should be in the house and probably not have voting rights. Mm -hmm. No, I would agree with that. And so no, he's it's a big probably, jerk. He is. And he, and again, he, that's his currency. Being a jerk is part of what he's selling, right? Like he's like, oh, you know, um, I'm a, I'm a sexist jerk. So give me money if you also, right. if you like that. Yeah. Right. yeah. And I don't care if he's like, I mean, somebody in the comments just said, I'm a conservative when it comes to feminist values. I think feminism is too divisive when it comes to the modern day relationship. And I think there's like fair criticisms and conversations to be had around that. And I have about a 
billion criticisms of feminism mm -hmm. itself. So I don't, I don't, I don't necessarily think it's helpful or true or yeah, like effective in any way when people just say like, oh, he's an anti-feminist, he hates feminism. I mean, he, of course he is, but I think that, I don't think that people need to sign on to feminism, the ideology in order to be like a good guy, I guess is what mm -hmm. I'm saying. No, not at all, not at all. Yeah, and I'm fine having political and intellectual disagreements with people. I just don't, I don't find him intellectually um, uh, interesting enough to even want to argue with the guy. You know, and the, but it's, what's yeah. unfortunate is he's made so much money becoming the face of this, and then again, like you pointed out, like what a completely unself-aware hypocrite to make this particular comment. So yeah, we give yeah. we probably give him too much attention though. Maybe we should move into other topics. <laughs> <laughs> and half okay. half an hour and Matt Walsh is probably too much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, like I just so I read your your post on Substack recently, um, which was called Do You Need Professional Help? Um, which essentially you can obviously explain it at length better than I can, but I think uh, part of it was about professionalizing normal human things and also like pathologizing normal human things. And I mean, part of the reason that I thought it was an important thing to talk about is because I hear over and over and over and over again from people in general, but you know, this is a woman centered stream, I suppose. Mm -hmm. So, you know, women who struggle to make new friends and feel like they're lacking community and feel isolated. Um, so, I mean, like, why don't you talk to us a bit about the post first before we get too deep into this sure. conversation? So probably most people over 40 will remember that the, the phrase, do you need professional help or you need professional help was kind of an insult given to people who, you know, like couldn't function well, right? It was like, oh, you know, I can't, this is beyond our friendship. You need professional help or you, you know, this, it wasn't a nice thing to say to somebody. It was like a implication that your problems are more severe than, than um, polite society can accommodate. So it's sort of a play on that, that, that now we're at this place where I feel like all of human behavior and, and all of society has been monetized into professional helpers, right? And that people don't have, um, community anymore. They're all hiring coaches and experts and consultants right. for what we used to provide for each other just as human beings. And I think that's sad. Yeah. Yeah. And well, yeah. And it's weird. Um, one thing that you wrote was, I, mean, I think this was probably your first paragraph, but I, you, you wrote that you saw an ad, you're talking about how play group saved your life when you were a mom and you had young kids or mm -hmm. were they babies and toddlers? Yeah. Um, I started when my daughter was a toddler, then I had my, my son. So when my children were little, um, it was community and the company of other women that really kept me from going insane, right? That, that, like I had this great play group and we just were there for each other. And so much of what we provided for each other is what I now see young mothers, um, hiring experts to do for them. Like we, right. we gave each other advice on how to deal with tantrums. We, we um, talked about nutrition and keeping kids healthy and feeding ourselves and our kids. Um, we, we all were, we did met at the home birth picnic. So we were all in the, in the natural birth world, but when someone was pregnant, you know, she could seek counsel with all these other women who'd had natural births. We gave each other breastfeeding advice. We actually like nursed each other's babies, which I feel primarily is something women have always done for each other. Now that's considered, um, it's okay to buy breast milk from a human milk bank, but the idea of actually putting your friend's baby to your own breast is still very taboo, right? Like it has to be mediated by professionals. It can't be, you can't just directly nurse your sister's kid, um, but it's you okay, okay to pay for it so that it's safe. Yeah. 
you can hook yourself up to a milking machine and then give the milk to a milk broker and then your sister can go buy it from that person. That's okay. But that's mm. creepy and weird and unsanitary if you just nurse your friend's baby. Um, so this, yeah, thinking about all the things we provided for each other have now been turned into professions. And I don't think it's helping. I think that humanity is kind of coming apart at the seams and the more professional help we have, the more dysfunctional we're becoming. It doesn't seem to be making us better at being human. No, it doesn't. And I mean, I, I guess I've always found it a bit strange because I've been hearing this for people from people for, I don't know, probably almost 15 years now where, and there's all sorts of articles that are written about this supposed problem, which is that, you know, after college, how do you make friends? And I never went to college, like not, I didn't have the college experience that people mm. are talking about in this context. I took a night class once a week at a college. <laughs> a I was at the work working class closet. college experience. <laughs> <laughs> where you take the bus to college for three hours after your job and then go home again. It's not much of a social experience. Uh, <laughs> right. But like, you know, like it's like I, so I didn't go to college and I've never had trouble making friends or having a social life. And when I was in Vancouver, I think, some people would say, oh, well, that's because you grew up in Vancouver, so you already had friends, which is true. You know, like I had mm. a, a bunch of friends that I'd known since high school, but I also had new friends that I'd made since then. And certainly, you know, in the past 10 years, I've made tons of new friends outside of, of that, you mm. know, high school slash college experience. And I also moved to a new country three years ago and made a whole new friend group. So I don't even need my old friends anymore. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, often, you know, in terms of talking about women in particular, I think that women will often say, you know, I got married and I had kids, so I stopped being able to socialize. And I don't know if that's true or not, because I'm not in those, those circumstances. Well, it was never true before. Like our I mean, most of us are from a long line of married women who had friends, right? Like that's like our moms had friends, our our grandmas had friends. I don't I don't remember this level of isolation in the adults around me when I was a child. It seemed like the adults had friends. Um, why would it be true now? I think I think a lot of things have changed about the society, but marriage itself hasn't mm -hmm. always prevented women from having friends. I, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, so my parents are in a codependent relationship. So okay. they oh. didn't, they did stop having friends. I remember mm -hmm. them having friends when I was little. My mm -hmm. dad worked at the post office. So he had all these like posty friends who I really liked. They were like working class guys who would take us fishing sometimes and teach us bad words and things like that. So that was fun. And, my mom had some friends, I think, from work. She worked for the art center. Um, and then they kind of just stopped having friends and were only friends with each other. And so as a teenager, I was like, well, I don't want to ever get married because this is so distasteful to me. And I don't want to be in a mm. relationship or have a life where my only friend is this one other person. And I can see how weird it makes you and how it sort of if you were ever antisocial before I think only being friends with the person you're married to and no one else would make that problem much worse <laughs> mm -hmm. but I think I mean yeah. I don't know I, 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 I guess I think that people I think that people sort of choose their problems and choose these problems in some ways um so much has changed in society in the last 50 years. And I, I don't want to completely put it on individuals, but I also think the only way you can change your life is to do it as an individual, right? So it's a, um, 
it's it's a both are true. Yes, society has made it harder to connect with other people and you can't blame society. You can't like society's not going to fix it. The same society that isolated all of us and commodified all of human behavior isn't going to fix the fact that you're isolated. You've got to do it yourself and we still do have that freedom and that power to do that. Um so yeah, I do th I think people choose their problems and only people can solve their problems. Yeah, I mean, I think that one of the things that people complain about, and I noticed that this was true in many ways in Vancouver, is that people, you know, I, I read another article about this issue this mm. week, too, coincidentally, and um, it was called The Friendship Problems. Somebody mm. named Rosie Spinks wrote it, and... What she said is, I'll just read part of her essay actually. One reasonable diagnosis of the problem is that it's entirely down to my own life choices. At 30, I moved to a smaller place away from London where I made most of my friends in my 20s. I am in a long-term partnership and I have a toddler, which means I'm strictly beholden to a bedtime routine for the maintenance of our collective sanity. Um, despite charading as a bubbly extrovert for years, I realized during the pandemic that I'm actually an introvert. I stopped going to an office and the after work drinks that perpetuate many urban millennial friendships, that sort of thing. It would be easy, correct even, to solve this friendship riddle by blaming all of the above and move on with my life. But beyond the fact that I have, you know, she says she's tried to go to like workout classes and use friend finding apps um, to meet new people. And she says, I've done all that. And then some, I think something else is going on. Um, and part of what she's complaining about is people canceling on her or not committing, but she seems to not be able to maintain these friendships. I just, I mean, I don't, I mean, joining workout class, using a friend finding app seems really weird and foreign to me but i guess like i think that the idea that I, like i wonder how many people had that experience of going through the pandemic um and determining that they were actually introverts and that they didn't actually like being around people as much as they thought they had i think that the lockdown policies were major social engineering that that did absolutely change our society and, and because it changed society, it obviously changed individuals. I think people, um, people got weird, you know, isolating people is, um, is a way to make people antisocial like that. And to make people crazy, um, solitary confinement is, is a torture technique that is used on, on prisoners. It's not something that creates good outcomes. And now we had all these people who were in solitary confinement with the illusion of interacting, right? With all the social media, which isn't real. Like we had talked mm -hmm. about that during the pandemic, the word virtual means not really real, right? <laughs> that that's, <laughs> that's what that means. <laughs> and that fake was- Fake reality. Fake reality. Wait a minute, what does that mean? <laughs> it's like almost real. It seems real, but it's not. That's what that means. And- Virtually and real. It's virtual and people um, substituted that for actual interaction. They were terrorized by the government and the media. A lot of people actually believed the hype about, you know, if they go outside, they're going to die. If they see, if they, if they hug someone, they're going to die or they're going to kill someone, which is even more frightening to people of like, I don't want to kill somebody. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, it made a lot of people weird. <laughs> Oh, and but because we have this um, pathologized, what does C.J. Hopkins calls it, the new pathologized totalitarianism, like where where we're all it's all medicalized, and people instead of being angry at the government for making us weird, being angry at the media for making us all messed up, it's like oh, I discovered I have autism, or I discovered I'm I'm an introvert. Yeah, I mean it definitely. I definitely noticed that people who had claimed to have social anxiety prior to all the lockdowns really dug their heels in on that, that mm -hmm. identity or diagnoses during and then afterwards also. I mean, I, I'm going to be honest that I think that 
the term and identity and diagnosis, whatever you want to call it, social anxiety is totally stupid. Like as if everybody, like I'm good at socializing and I have lots of friends and I talk to people all the time. I talk to strangers all the time from my job, but like I still have social anxiety in mm -hmm. certain situations. I spend a lot of time alone. And if I don't do that, I start to feel anxious. Right. Like this idea that other people aren't experiencing that or that other people might not feel a little bit nervous going into a party or, you know, some kind of gathering where they didn't know people or they didn't know very many people or they didn't know what it would be like or they didn't know if they were going to have fun or not and then how are they going to leave? I mean, I think we all have those experiences and you kind of just do it anyway or sometimes you don't. But like this is life and the response instead is to pathologize and avoid because now you have this excuse like where you have you have this thing so you can't possibly do this thing right and this thing i have makes me different and special i'm not like i'm not neurotypical i'm not like the normies who never get anxious and who um i don't even know what people who like to claim this being neurologically atypical or being um being different, what they think a normie life is like. But I've I've never met a person who didn't have um, have some level of angst and anxiety and some level of what used to be called the human condition, where they're struggling with incarnation. You know that these these are ancient re, uh, acknowledged realities that life is suffering and we all are existentially alone, but we have to get it together and, and work together for each other. The, the, the cure for suffering is to be helpful to others. These are what people have all been wrestling with these issues since people have been writing things down, but suddenly everyone feels they're alone in it and it makes them special and different. And they're withdrawing from the social contract based on these pathology identities that they're developing. And we're unraveling. You know? Well, and I think that there's there's a thing, there's an overriding thing where people think that things should be easy or natural. And that's just not always the case. And I mean, I'm I'm not like a fan of continuing to do something that feels bad or trying to force, you know, a friendship or a relationship mm. that is, isn't happening, like feels draining or the other person right. keeps canceling or you never feel like hanging out. Like, of course, then don't. But I, I mean, the other reality is that making friends and keeping friends does take work, you mm -hmm. know, it does take energy and it takes effort and you have to try and you do have to, you know, spend time together in person. I mean, obviously there's some people that you, you can't always do that with, but I think like, I wonder, I don't know. It just, it feels to me like people are really lazy in a lot of ways. Like these people who are, you know, it's like, I don't have any friends and the people that I try to be friends with just cancel all the time and then nothing ever happens. And sort of like, like, I don't know. I'm not, I don't know quite what to make of that. Cause I think that is a reality. Like I knew people in Vancouver who, you know, I had a friend group in Vancouver that is no longer my friend group because they basically like both got too woke and also just started annoying me with their feminine passive aggressiveness where they all played nice to each other and then would trash everybody behind their backs. And somebody would give somebody the silent treatment. I was like, you guys are fucking annoying and exhausting right. <laughs> but like they you know it would take us months and months and months just to have like a wine night with like you know four or five people basically because somebody would cancel and somebody else would cancel and then somebody would just feel tired and somebody would have cramps and so, you know and it was like oh you guys like this shouldn't be this hard you're not act you're not that busy like you're right. not when you're not like i'm i'm just as busy as anyone if not more so, I'm, I'm sure I'm not busier. I'm probably not busier than you, Mary Lou, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a pretty busy pretty person. Busy. I am. But you still have friends? I do have friends. And my, you know, my <laughs> friends are so important to me. And I, um, 
I also have people that I wouldn't so much say are my friends, but they are part of my community and I would show up for them if they needed me. And I would hope they would do the same for me because I think we've lost that piece of it as well as um, we don't have larger communities. People don't know their neighbors. People don't right. um, go to church as much as they used to. People don't have... Um, have a you know a social club like I don't know what was going on at things like the Elks Club, but there were a lot of those when I was growing up where guys would like go meet and be friends, you know, and um like we don't have these social clubs where you don't have to be friends with every guy at what I imagine the Elks Club is like, <laughs> but that's your community. And if you if if you need help, if you, you know, like your roof collapses, these guys will show up and help you whether or not they're your best friend or not. Or the same with like the women in my neighborhood would show up if some had a tragedy in their family, even though all of these women weren't best friends, they they were a community and they felt some level of responsibility for each other and a level of a social safety net in each other. We've lost that. Like you don't have to be best friends with everybody to be friendly and to be um, in relationship. Yeah. Uh, and I think, I mean, I think one of the big things that's probably missing is from, from people's lives who are, who are talking about experiencing isolation and not having mm -hmm. community and so on and so forth is religion, because that's probably mm -hmm. one of the easiest ways. I'm not religious, <laughs> mm -hmm. but you know, I think that is, you know, I think the church probably is your instant community. And I think that's probably a major benefit of being religious. Mm -hmm. And I think that people who don't have that don't really know how to replicate that or what to do. And and pro it probably doesn't even occur to them, you know, like, mm -hmm. I mean, you have to, it's also cultural. Like, I mean, Vancouver in particular is a super isolating place because socializing isn't set up in a way where you do meet other people mm -hmm. um you know it just it, it's not a very friendly place but like if you go to a bar you have to sit at the table with the person that you came with there's all these weird mm. licensing like liquor licensing laws and stuff like that that prevent people from socializing with one another and often people are like, oh, well, I don't want to talk to like randos at the bar anyway. But I mean, if you, you know, on, I mean, I don't, I don't want to pretend to be like an expert on Mexican culture or anything, but I, one of the major parts that I like about living here is that you can just kind of walk outside and see people that you know, or you can just go hang out. Like you can mm -hmm. just go into the plaza and sit down and hang out and just talk to whoever is there. And that's totally normal and nice. So you don't really have to make plans with anybody. And mm -hmm. I think that's how things should be. And I think that that just isn't the culture in a lot of these urban settings. I think that that's part of the problem that we're talking like these people who are complaining about these things or maybe they're living in cities which ironically are full of lots of people but nobody can make friends with each other and nobody hangs out <laughs> right and you know i i think one of the big differences between mexico and the united states and canada is in mexico every single bit of human life hasn't been commoditized right that they're mm -hmm. still you can hang out in the in the plaza and for free, you know, and, and listen to music because people are just yeah. playing music. <laughs> so, um, it's um, it definitely makes people friendlier if if everything doesn't cost money um, and you yeah. just you know people just hanging out. So there are these real societal blockages to to creating friendships. And then women also are in a place where they need money. Everything costs more money. So if you are like somebody who's really friendly and good at hanging out, there's this temptation to become a life coach or to become to commoditize friendship, right? To like, you can um, come to my gathering if you pay this much money and hang out with other women. So I recognize the societal pressures and I really don't want to sound like I'm being too harsh on individuals. And I also recognize the only real way we can change is to change ourselves. You know, we can't, um, 
the this like the government's not going to make this this problem better for us right like no. more professionals isn't going to make it better more more um more experts more studies so what can people do like how do you how do we make friends and then as a midwife as a mom as now a grandma like how do we help our children be better at this too so it's getting better generationally not getting weirder and worse generationally yeah I think that's a good point, actually, that everything, if you're in an urban setting, everything costs money. Like, there's not really any free spaces. Um, mm -hmm. If you, if you're going to, you know, even when there's, like, outdoor festivals and outdoor parties, you have to pay. Um, and there's not, yeah, I feel like there's not a public space where you can kind of just hang around um, mm -hmm. and talk to whoever's sitting next to you. Like the libraries, but you're not supposed to talk there. Like the library is one of the few. <laughs> well, and the libraries and urban spaces are pretty gross, to be honest. Like they're full yeah. of like stinky homeless people and crazy people and, you know, creeps. I know. And the poor library <laughs> employees are having to do all these trainings on administering Narcan and and being social and workers. And dealing with basically. violent people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's really, yeah. really sad. Um but there still are like for for parents, you know, for moms, for for people taking care of little kids, there still are free story times at libraries. That's a great place to go and meet other people if you're in that phase of life where I hear a lot of women feeling isolated with little kids. Like there still are there still are enough like little fragments of of health and community. Um, there are still places to volunteer. I am a big believer that if you feel depressed and sad, one of the best remedies is go help someone else. Like get out of your own narcissistic head and realize no matter how bad your situation, somebody has it worse, right? Like there's somebody that's having a worse time. So go, go be helpful or go be nice or go meet a neighbor or go like make, make some cookies and <laughs> take them next door. Yeah. I mean, I guess I also just, I feel like if you're kind of, if you're out doing things then you naturally meet people and make mm -hmm. friends like of course if you're just in your house online or watching netflix or doing whatever you're doing at home like you're never gonna meet people or make friends i mean this is why i find the idea of using a friend app so hilarious it's like well if you just like went and like i mean this is gonna sound stupid because i keep trying to think about like how i make friends but it's like i just mm -hmm. you just do like you're out doing things you're at events you're going to meetings you're going to parties and you meet somebody you start talking and you like them so you become friends and you try hanging out together to kind of see if it sticks mm -hmm. um but you can also like i mean doing sports or like joining yeah. joining a gym not just to go work by yourself but joining a gym where you're doing like I don't know martial arts or Muay Thai or something like that I think that's like a perfect way to make friends and build connections mm -hmm. with people um but anything I mean I don't I'm like what do people like doing <laughs> right <laughs> besides going to the bar I mean I go to I go to the gym too and I have made friends yeah. at the gym but like <laughs> You know, I, um, I'm a crocheter and a knitter. And one thing I love about going to the yarn store is that there's always a table of women and sometimes they're usually like women of all ages sitting there knitting and talking. And sometimes it's really wild. Like, um, sometimes I go in and it is like the most woke propaganda coming out of people's mouths. And, and then the next time I go in, it's a bunch of old ladies talking about the great reset and the world economic forum. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. You know, so it's like really a dynamic place where people obviously have very different belief systems come and just sit. And I think women have always done that. Like women have always sat and, and created together and all the, the drudgery that the women wanted to get away from when we were isolated in our nuclear homes and didn't have the women around us, that was all made easier when we did it together. Like even cleaning your house is more fun if you've got a group of women doing it or just, you know, like get together and do yard work together. There's, there's always something that needs to be done. And usually it's easier to do it with more than one person. Yeah. I mean, when I was over on the island, like, you know, Vancouver Island is pretty spread out. It's a rural place. And so mm -hmm. you would think it would be hard to meet people but it's not. And 
you know, <laughs> I guess maybe one of the positive things that came out of the response to COVID was that people got together and started just gathering together to be around people that mm -hmm. were um, sort of, you know, had common interests. I suppose, and, and common values, which doesn't mean you should only hang around with people that agree with everything that you think, but they were having these potlucks regularly mm -hmm. and they were getting together and having meetings and it's like, oh, well, you know, these people hang out at this cafe at this time and you can kind of show up and then you talk to them and then you have new friends um, and people would go to the Legion. Like I, over on one of the little golf islands where my, my parents live, um, there's a legion over there and a friend of mine started working as the bartender there. So we went to visit him. And first of all, he told me that the legion, you know, practically saved his life because he felt so isolated during mm. the lockdowns and was, you know, brutally, brutally attacked and ostracized mm. and rejected by, you know, practically every friend that he had had back in the old days and in Vancouver and in his circles and things were obviously so awful and divisive and he found some like-minded people at the Legion. Um, but also, you know, I, I stopped by on a Sunday afternoon and there was like this seniors band and all these seniors were dancing and having like a conga line and, you know, the, cool. there's yeah it was so great and I was like you know you know this is on a little island where there's not very many yeah. people like you just you can't use the excuse of being spread out or or mm -hmm. of not knowing anybody you do kind of have to just like show up and start talking to people and and I don't know thing I mean I feel like things happen organically you meet people and then they say oh you should come to this thing and then you meet other people or like yeah. oh you would maybe like to connect with so and so you just sort of follow things that are interesting to you and hang around and and be a bit open I don't I don't know if that's very helpful advice Alice in the live chat just said um when we go to the bar I prefer sitting at the bar so I can engage which is what I've been doing for years and years and years I would do that in Vancouver all the time because I hated feeling isolated at a table I didn't only want to talk to the person that I came in with and if you sit at a bar the person next to you is going to start talking to you or you're going to start okay. talking to them and, and I've made friends sitting at the bar, um, you know, just like on a Saturday afternoon. And I went to, you know, watch the fights and like have a drink or I went to have something to eat. And the woman sitting next to me was like, oh, or, you know, I, I go out and read all the time, too. Like I go out for dinner by myself and I read a book and then, you know, somebody will be like, oh, what are you reading? And I'm not talking about men. I don't necessarily want to be hit on in those situations. But, you know, women... I've met women, I've met male friends, you know, you just, just leave your house. I feel like, <laughs> yeah, sort of leave, leave your house and like do things that you like doing, but, and then, yeah, you do have to, you have to kind of put in an effort too. And it's not, it's not easy. Yeah. Always. I think that, you know, when you're talking about small rural areas, um, I think that rural places and, people of the working class um, understand the importance of community more than in urban centers where everything is, although you can purchase human interaction, right? Like I think that if you live in like rural Montana, you might die if your neighbor doesn't show up and help you whenever a blizzard yeah. comes through and you've got to get your animals in or you, you need to fortify your house. Um, or if you're working class and you, you can't, you can't hire somebody to, to, you know, I mean, like right now they have like what are called uh, night nurses where women are hiring like night nannies to sleep with the baby and then bring the baby in when the, the baby needs to nurse. Like working class women can't can't hire um, what sisters used to do for each other. They can't hire all of this um, this social support. So I think that people of the working class people in rural areas still understand like we need each other. We're social organ organisms. We're going to die if we don't have each other in the same way like one bee can't survive by itself. One yeah. human can't survive by ourselves. Yeah. And I think that's what people do understand in places that are full of poor people 
and working class people is that they know that they need each other and that they can't just exist on their own and that they do need to talk to their neighbors and rely on their neighbors. And again, like, you know, this relates to what you said earlier, that your social life isn't going to consist of going somewhere that you have to pay to get in. It's going to be going outside mm-hmm. into the street or the yard or, you know, the, the, the dirt road next to you and hanging around with the people who live in your little community and having food and, you know, the kids play and et cetera, Mm -hmm. et cetera. Um, And it's, you know, it's really unfortunate that cities aren't set up in that way. And I think that's a really big part of why I moved away from the city. And I don't want to, I don't think I want to live in a big city again. I don't, I, you know, I don't, it's, it's not very fun and it's not warm and I don't think that it's very healthy. And I don't, I feel like it would be a disaster in a disaster for all of these reasons. Cause you don't Mm -hmm. know your neighbors and you would have no idea where to go. Like here Mm -hmm. you would know where to go to find people. If you needed help, you could just walk outside. But you know, in Vancouver, what would I, you know, I, I thought about this constantly when I was in Vancouver, I was like, what would I do if there was an earthquake? Mm -hmm. What would I do? Where would I go? How would I know? where anybody that I knew was, where would I go to get help? Like, how would I find my sister? How would I find my friends? Mm -hmm. I couldn't, you know, we don't have cell phones. We don't have any way of communicating. I don't, you know, like it's, it's, it's super scary. I don't know if other people worry about that as much as I do, but I don't, I don't think that they do because people are not necessarily leaving cities in droves. But it, it's obviously a very different mindset if you look at how the cities behaved during lockdown and how the rural areas did. I know here in New Mexico where we had literally the strictest lockdown of any state. It was it, for me, it was hell. It was just horrible. Where we we had to wear masks outside. Everyone on t- over two had to wear a mask all the time. Um, you had to wear masks in the shower at the public pools. People went insane in the cities. Most people complied. In the rural areas, there was a lot more like you know screw it. And like people weren't afraid of COVID Mm -hmm. because you don't have time to be afraid of COVID. For one thing, rural people live more dangerous lives and they have a different Mm -hmm. risk assessment than people living in the city. And it's like, okay, if I'm um, working on a ranch, my chances of dying every day are much higher than my chances of dying as a young, healthy person who gets COVID. So I'm not going to worry about that. In the same way, like roofers were less worried about COVID than people who just sit at their desk, you know, and don't have any risk in their lives. Um, but I think the cities are more compliant. They are more ripe for being managed by by the government and corporations. And people are less free in general and less safe. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't, I, yeah, I don't think, sorry, do you have to go? No, no. I just wanted to talk about the whole like anxiety and social anxiety. Should we talk oh, about that? Yes, please like, do. Yeah. So I want to say that, you know, I come from a long line of, of anxious temperaments. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> it's just like my, do you have anxiety? Well, I, yeah, I mean, I think everyone has some degree of anxiety, but I, I'm wired in a way that that's a common thing I experience. And to me, the worst thing you can do if you have that kind of nervous system is to um, avoid what's making you anxious because of that, that's just training you to become more and more anxious. And I'm not really into reductionism these days and having to prove everything with, with science, but even the VA and other places that treat people with severe PTSD understand like the, the way to help someone heal from that level of anxiety is to do the thing you're afraid of more, not to avoid it, right? right? So if you have social anxiety, the key is go be social again and again and realize it didn't kill you. You're all right. <laughs> like you, right. And for me, you know, it's, um, it's taken me a long time in my life to get to the point where I can just calmly acknowledge, oh, I'm feeling the physical sensation of anxiety. All it means is my nervous system is firing in a, in a way that's that's making me feel these physical sensations. My adrenal glands are making adrenaline. I'm feeling these physical sensations. I don't need to go looking for a mental reason why I might be dying or why, <laughs> like why, why I should get freaked out. And then just move on and do keep doing the thing that might have triggered that sensation is the way to... to um, 
not be paralyzed by that temperament. And, and instead, I see the exact opposite happening, especially in people under 30 that, oh, I have social anxiety, so I can't leave my house. And, and we're normalizing what used to be called agoraphobia, which was considered an extremely serious psychiatric condition where people were so anxious they couldn't leave their house. And now a large percentage of young people are just claiming that as, as their whole being and their identity. It's very concerning to me. Yeah. I, yeah. I, it, I think it's, it's concerning as well. And I, I think it must be tied into this glorification of mental illness and this mm -hmm. overdiagnosing of everything and this diagnosing of what are really normal feelings and normal behaviors as a condition that you need to treat with drugs. And now, now you're this, like, mm -hmm. it's not just like, okay, maybe you're experiencing depression because of something that's happening in your life or maybe you know something that happened in your life past trauma or abuse or something like that mm -hmm. um same goes for anxiety um and, but even like this i just like categorizing everybody in these ways like are you an introvert or are you an extrovert <laughs> right like and if you're an introvert of course you don't want to go out and you may, you don't want to make friends and you don't want to be in social situations or crowded places. Um, you have to be at home by yourself or maybe with one other person. And it's not like, I don't think there's anything wrong with, again, you know, I like, I like being by myself. I think it's really important for us to spend time alone. Obviously you have to. Um, and, and some people yeah. are better at socializing than other people. I think some people feel more energized by socializing than other people. And maybe some people feel more drained by that. But I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be a label. And I think that the label is limiting because I think you must probably start thinking of yourself as this kind of person who does this kinds of thing and who can't do this other thing. Or of course, you're not going to like this thing. You're not going to want to go to this kind of um situation. You're not going to want to do this, this type of activity because you're an introvert. Right. Right. And at risk of like feeding into pathologizing all of human life, I, I just want to say it's just, it's just so profoundly narcissistic to claim these identities as a way of separating ourselves from other people. Like, oh, you know, I'm different from everybody else because I feel these physical sensations whenever I go into a new social setting. Most people, you know, I'm different from, from everyone else. I'm special. It needs to be acknowledged. I have this special disorder identity. And it's so interesting, like all the disorder identities, the one people seem to claim least is I'm a narcissist, right? You know <laughs> That's essentially what people are saying whenever it's like, well, I, you know, I'm basically, it's a way of announcing, like, I'm a narcissist. I think I'm different. I think I'm, I'm more unique than any other person. My needs come first. I am not part of the social group. I don't have any obligation to other people. It, you may, you know, and you it may doesn't start. matter how my behaviors affect other people. Exactly. Because exactly. I have this, this problem, this diagnosis, like, people who, I don't know, I'm trying to think of what the, what the word that I've seen used, but you know, like people who say that they're on the spectrum and I'm not going to say, because I'm not qualified to know whether or not that's a real thing. If there's really people, I mean, I think autism is a real thing, but you know, people who are like, Oh, I'm on, I'm on the spectrum or I'm sort of like, I have Asperger's or I have something along these lines, which means that I'm rude to people all the time. I know, um, totally. <laughs> <laughs> It's and okay I can't possibly to... not be rude to people because no. this is, you know, who I am. <laughs> it's, it's okay for me to be an asshole because I'm autistic. Like that, okay, I mean, you know, most people who follow my work know I, I have a lot of criticisms of psychiatry. I, I feel like out with the exception of like true psychotic conditions, like psycho, you know, schizophrenia and, and bipolar and true psychosis. I just think this is all bullshit. It's just ways of labeling mm -hmm. the human condition. It's not. Okay, I'm on your side. Now that yeah, you've said it, I agree. <laughs> People get really upset because they have a lot of investment in these psychiatric conditions. And this is, this. I want to acknowledge this is the field of humanity we've created to address human suffering. So I am compassionate that people are suffering when they seek a label from that field. And I'm not, I'm not totally, my heart's not totally hardened to them. I just don't think it's helping anyone. I think it's making everyone more nuts and more unhappy. But 
this autism thing is just such a, you know, unscientific, um, unhelpful spectrum that is being promoted here. And I often at this point, I'm just, I just come out and say to people who want to claim that this identity as being autistic or their children being autistic because they're just kind of weird. I tell people, you know, I, I know people in my community who are autistic, who are in their 20s, who wear diapers and have never said a word in their life and have never made mm -hmm. eye contact and will have to live with their families forever or probably be abused in some terrible home because they cannot care for themselves at all. They can't brush their own teeth. They cannot, they cannot figure out how to, to groom themselves. And if those people um, behave the way 99% of people who claim to be autistic are behaving, their families would consider them completely cured. This right. is, it's insulting to people who truly have autism for everybody to be claiming this. And it's not helpful. It's not helping anyone. It's just giving people excuses to not um, learn social skills. It's harder for some people to learn social skills, but you still have to do it. It's, it's harder for some of us to learn to read and we still have to learn to read, you know, it's like we you just have to work harder at it. Yeah. I mean, I think that the thing that I'm hearing a lot is this, you know, I, I don't, I can't tell how other people around me are feeling or reacting to me. So maybe I'm, you know, dominating a conversation and I have no idea how not to do that because I'm not aware that other people are being left out of the conversation or getting annoyed with me or whatever. And to me, that does sound like you're just diagnosing yourself as a narcissist because like <laughs> then pay attention to how right. often other people are speaking versus you and try to ask somebody else a question or something like that. Right. Right. <laughs> well, you know, Megan, I'm an empath. So, <laughs> so it's really easy. For, no, I'm just kidding. Right, like, you're I, always I, telling I, me. <laughs> Over text. Actually, I know. And I'm like, I mean, if if I was into these things and I wanted to have a convenient excuse, I would totally diagnose myself as having ADHD. I've said this many times. I mean, totally. I think I have like pretty much all the symptoms of ADHD. People tell me I don't understand, but I think I really do understand because I think I have exactly what they have. It's just that I think that I just have some struggles that I struggle with in my life around focusing and forgetting things and not being able to get things done and procrastinating and mm -hmm. a wide variety well, of others, not getting as much done as I'd like to get done. You know, as a medical professional, I tell you, you also apparently have oppositional defiant disorder <laughs> <laughs> and you, you Don't tell me what to uh, do. Yeah. I think that you might have impulse control disorder. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I have taking. these things. Yeah, excessive risk. <laughs> um, I, you know, it's so insane. Like, I can think of at least twelve psychiatric diagnoses that that I could qualify for, and I'm I'm not interested in that because I don't want to identify as being mentally ill. It's not useful to me. No. I want to be healthy. <laughs> like, have no, I don't know what. Like, what would be the point? Unless, of course, I did want to take speed every day. Yeah. Um, my brain and, is special and different, and I get more done when I take speed. <laughs> yeah, just like everybody. Exactly. <laughs> That's right. how it works. <laughs> yeah, I like, and yeah, Megan in the live chat was saying you, it's like a muscle, you need resistance to make it stronger. And Alice is right. responding, saying, I just need to go by myself to the coffee shop tomorrow, <laughs> maybe. And I mean, but beyond the fact that if you want to get over, an anxiety that you have, I think one of the best ways to deal with it, and I'm not talking about like pushing yourself into unsafe situations, um, but like I feel nervous about going to the new gym because I feel like I'll feel insecure and I don't know where all the machines are and I won't know what to do there or something like that. The best way to get over something like that is to, of course, just go and do it. And then maybe you feel stupid a little bit at first, but you figure it out and then you don't feel stupid anymore. Um, and then, and it also is empowering. Like those kinds of things are real. They're really simple things to do that can build confidence. And I've been trying to talk about that lately because I think 
I've learned from not doing that. Like I think when I was younger, when I was in my early 20s, I think I was totally paralyzed by fear of feeling stupid or looking stupid. Mm -hmm. Like, like, oh, well, I don't want to go to this class or I don't want to, you know, you know, like I won't know what I'm doing and um, I'm going to look like an idiot or I don't want to travel to this new place because I won't know anybody. And what if it's scary? And what if I don't know which, you know, train to take all of these things? And the the best way to get over it is again by doing it. But then you feel really good about yourself and you're like, oh, I'm a self-sufficient person who can do things and take care of things in my life. And also you realize that feeling stupid or feeling anxious or feeling insecure isn't really that big of a deal. Right. And you also learn that most people are nice people and nice people like helping other people. And right. that it actually feels kind of nice to help someone learn how to, to use the machine at the gym if you know how to use it. Right. Like that's, it doesn't take a lot of time and it makes that person feel good about themselves. And that's a gift to them that you got to, you gave them the gift of helping you. Um, and, and you might like, make a friend. You might make a friend. You might make a friend. <laughs> totally. It's true. I mean, I think that's a great way to make friends is to do mm -hmm. new and weird things where you don't know what you're doing, where you have to ask somebody to help. And then you might make friends with yeah your yes. neighbor or the mechanic or whatever it is. Um, Marsha in the, in the chat says, I got over being nervous by interviewing people, which I, I don't know why I completely forgot about this, but when I st first started doing journalism, like when I was in journalism school, I was terrified to call people and ask questions. Mm. Like, you know, you're just calling somebody that you don't know to just ask them a bunch of questions or to like go up to somebody at a public event with a microphone and be like, can I ask you some questions? That's a really, really scary thing to do probably for most people, but mm -hmm. I had to because it was, it was like my school assignments. And then it was like your job when you're interning. Um, I did an internship for the Thai, which was a local paper. And so you just have no choice. You just have to do it. And it doesn't scare me at all anymore. I have no mm -hmm. qualms about going up to somebody and asking questions or calling somebody. You know, there's not there. I used to feel really nervous about doing interviews for radio or for the podcast or whatever. And I don't feel nervous at all because I've done it so many times. And and even again, like even when maybe there's somebody that you feel a little bit nervous about because you're intimidated by their intellect or something like that, or they're wor you're worried they'll be mean to you. Um, but just pushing through and realizing that it's actually okay teaches you not to be afraid of it and that you can do it. And I, yeah, I'm really, I'm really, I don't know, depressed at the fact that we live in this culture and that the younger generations are growing up believing that they shouldn't ever do anything that feels uncomfortable or that they don't want to do and they, they should just sit in their safe spaces, which means being at home online and again, getting the, all their, their problems with depression and anxiety and whatever else it is, just get worse that way. It's, it's just feels like such a, um, a quagmire of it's just like feeding on itself and getting worse and worse. And, um, you know, the school systems are getting more and more dysfunctional. No children are getting their needs met. The only way to get any individualized attention for your child is to get them diagnosed with some kind of, of psychiatric or neurological problem. And then you've created a child who believes they have a psychiatric or neurological problem and they need special, they're different and special from everyone else. And I think, again, it's, it's so enormous and multifactorial and yes, I want systemic change. And I know the only way to start that change is at the individual level. And I really encourage parents to, you know, like encourage your children to do things they don't want to do. <laughs> like it's all these old, these old um, practices that seem so oppressive to me in childhood. I, I look now and think of the the collective wisdom of making a kid sit still for an hour in church or, or a bunch of old ladies are going to like, you it know, does shame them you. like hell to be honest. <laughs> it's really intense. Like even but now. It can really help you to learn to sit still and keep your mouth shut for an hour. Right. Like there's, 
that's a really good skill to learn to like sit still and keep your mouth shut, you know, just like sit still and be <laughs> observant for an hour that, that can help you out. You know? um, the, uh, like all these things we, we wanted to, we threw away the entire institution because of, yeah, a lot of things were really rotten. We've lost the, the um, gifts of that. Same with, um, you know, all that, that benign neglect we got as Generation X kids of um, just running around unsupervised with a pack of children, kids normal each other up in a pack, right? Like you sort of learned right. if, like you learn not to be a weirdo or or everyone's going to like be mean to you because you're a weirdo, right? Like they, it's like a rock tumbler effect of childhood that's been lost. Yeah, um, totally. <laughs> you're like, there's some forms of bullying that work. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's even bullying, like, yeah, if kids are really being physically, you know, they're damaging each other, it's one thing. But yeah, this like socialization, <laughs> other young animals do it to each other too. You know, puppies will do it. The, you know, other little mammals rough each other up, right? Or smooth each other's edges. Like this is yeah. how you be normal. Yeah. Yeah. This woman, the, the article that I referenced by, uh, Rosie Spinks. Uh, she actually she she referenced Esther Perel, who I don't love all that much, but I did think that it was a useful concept um, because she was talking about like how kids, you know, when you're a kid, you just go out and play on the street. <clears throat> um, you know, when I was a kid, we would move to a new co-op. We, we lived in like two different co-ops. We weren't moving all the time. But I remember being a kid and you move to a new co-op so you don't know any of the other co-op kids and you want to play. And you would either just, you know, go out and play in the courtyard and then you would get to join whatever game the kids are playing. And it was scary. Like I remember being a kid and feeling nervous about doing those things. Or you'd just go over to the neighbor's house or like I would remember being like, oh, I saw a girl my age who lived at that door. So you go over to the door and you ring the bell and you say like, can the girl who lives in the house come out and play? <laughs> and I remember my parents making me do that because I think I, when I was, I was quite shy when I was a kid and I think I wanted kind of more help and support in that thing. And they would be like, no, you can just go over there. Just go over and ask her if she can play. And then you have mm -hmm. a new friend and, and that's just not something that's normalized as adults. And I'm not necessarily advocating going over to somebody's house and ringing their doorbell and asking them to come out. But I think that that idea of going out into the street or going out into the public space and talking to the people who are around you and um, sort of having less of a rigid, organized life and and also being open when other people talk to you when you're mm -hmm. in those spaces um and i think you can kind of give off a vibe of being open to talking and open to not talking you know like i know that if i'm really not in the mood to socialize i think that i'm i'm pretty good about making sure that that doesn't happen um right. but uh, yeah and i and then it also made me think that i was like but i bet a lot of kids aren't doing that nowadays no. And, and things are different too. Like a lot of kids are porn exposed when they're really young and people don't, you know, a lot of parents are afraid of what their kids are going to be exposed to if they just hang out with the neighborhood kids. That was always a risk. Like there was always the, you know, the kid who knew dirty jokes or something, but it's such, such more of a risk than it used to be. So I do want to acknowledge that that's happening, but you still can like encourage your kids to push past their natural hesitation or their shyness if they're a shy kid and yeah, just make a friend, go play, do all of that. It's so complicated. Yeah. I did. I think we should end this because it's been an hour mm. and a half and I want to let you go. Also, I did want to mention because I thought this question was interesting. This is from somebody named Hulwin who said, um, I've been thinking a lot lately about alternative health care and women, both as patients and practitioners. And I read Mary Lou's recent piece, Do I Need Professional Help? And I feel like I had very similar thoughts, except that mine came out more as a rant to friends. And then she says, have you heard of death doulas? Basically, you outsource the emotional labor of sitting with a dying friend slash family member slash community member 
And the shocking thing to me was how many people that I ranted to wanted to outsource this emotional labor and wanted their children to as well. Ooh, yeah, I've had those same thoughts before. I think, um, I think doulas, the whole, the existence of birth doulas is a symptom of the destruction of community that people don't have hmm. a friend or a sister or an aunt or a mom who not only will show up for them, but that is comfortable with the train of birth, like women, women's culture used to include an understanding of natural birth. And now that after the industrialization of birth, people are really, really disconnected from understanding that. So we've created this whole para profession. I don't think doulas are a good thing. I think it's it's really sad and messed up that we even need that. And now death doulas, mm -hmm. obviously, I feel the same thing. I also think, you know, just the thing about death work is like you can't really mess it up so you don't really need a profet like you shouldn't need professional help with that right. like death is the expected outcome so that's really sad that there's not somebody in your community who is reconciled enough with their own mortality to be able to sit comfortably with death um Ideally, we should all get to that place at least by the time we're in our 50s or 60s, right? I mean, there should be somebody you know who's okay sitting with death, but we're so freaked out by death. We're just really not okay with it. And now we're creating a profession of that. And what I see is the more doulas we have, the more fucked up birth gets. Now, the more death mm. doulas we have. Now, we're going to have this illusion that you can have a good death. And we're just going to have worse and worse deaths. Um, hmm. I don't know how to repair this. I mean, it's just like one person at a time. Um, I, I think you, you know, we have to show up for each other. Um, I also think, you know, I don't know what's going to happen, but I think if you know history and you look around now, there's a chance that we're in for a contraction of the economy and for um, a pretty bad recession or a depression and we won't be able to professionalize this stuff and maybe maybe we'll figure it out how to help each other then but that to me is another reason why you need to start in community now you need to start being the kind of person other people want to help right when things really mm. go down and you're um a self-declared narcissist who doesn't need friends, it's not going to be good for you. Right? Yeah, like, that's a really good point. I mean, you can be sort of narcissistic about uh, your, your efforts to build community and create friendships because you might need help one day. And you right? probably will need help one day. I think everybody needs help at some point. But yeah, I think that... I mean, I think with regard to the death doula question, of course, I think that in Western cultures, people don't really know how to grieve and they don't grieve mm -hmm. as a community. And that's not true in most other cultures. Mm -hmm. um, so I can understand feeling like, oh, maybe I should pay somebody to help me with this because I don't really know what to do because I don't have any traditions surrounding mm -hmm. death. And... I don't have any traditions surrounding death. You know, like I came from an atheist, you know, non-religious family that didn't have a community or a big family. It was just, you know, me and my sister and my parents. And as I said before, my parents were pretty antisocial. So, you know, and I, I always felt sort of sad and mad about that. I was always jealous of my friends that had big families and, and communities and knew how to celebrate or of course grieve, I suppose. Um, but yeah, I guess, I mean, I think that for sure the solution isn't to just pay somebody and I, I'm not against therapy. You know, I think therapy can be helpful, but I think that therapy is probably overemphasized in our society where like, Oh, we'll go see it there. And I mean, I tell people to go see therapists all the time. Yeah. Um, but you know, I think that, it, yeah. like it's sort it, of like buying your way out of it or buying your way to feeling better. I think people should seek solution focused therapy and the goal shouldn't be 
to be in therapy forever. And the goal shouldn't be to um, adopt a mental illness identity for the rest of your life, right? Which seems to be what's happening with the mental illness industry. I yeah. do want to, you know, I that's true that we're so disconnected and people don't have any um, any memory of what their their lineage was in terms of death and birth in, in terms of a conscious memory. And that's several generations old now. Um, uh, Rochelle Seliga Garcia is a really brilliant mom and she, she has coined the train term innate traditions and really it's like helping, how do we help ourselves wake up these instincts? Like these are things we know how to do. It's in you to know how to, sit with the dying. It's in you to know how to be in community with other humans because you come from an uninterrupted line of your species. It's in there in your instincts, like every other species can figure it out. So um, really trying to get more in touch with, with what's innate and what's just an epigenetic memory and often just sitting and breathing. Again, death would be a good place to start because you literally can't fuck it up. You know, <laughs> just be Maybe. present with if somebody's dying, just be there and be in the moment. And if you can't do that, then that should be the goal of your therapy is to learn to sit with what's uncomfortable and be present with the moment, right? That's that's how you deal with all these things we've been discussing the whole time. Yeah. Well, I think that's a good place to end with death. <laughs> all roads lead to certain death. literal stream <laughs> um maria asked me what my shirt says it says don't <laughs> drink the kool-aid you can buy this shirt in my merch store on teespring which i've linked to down below in the show notes um again mary lou's substack if you want to read her piece it's there do you need professional help help is the the post that we were talking about today but there's tons of good stuff on there and that's at enchantedfamilymedicine.substack.com which is again linked to in the show notes if you would be so kind as to like and subscribe i would appreciate that because fuck youtube i can say that now because i'm <laughs> positive that they demonetized us about 15 minutes into our stream as soon as we started talking about anything to do with trans um as soon as we said he, probably, <laughs> that was that for monetization. <laughs> um, and what else? How I Healed is is Mary Lou's new podcast, and that's on Spotify and all the other podcast apps and also on Substack as well. And I hope that you all will join us next Wednesday evening and every Wednesday evening for all of eternity until we die. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for, for joining everybody and thanks for joining as always mary lou thank you thanks for doing this yeah okay we'll see you guys all next week i hope